there is a whole community of people out there who feel connected to my story because at the end of the day, we all have a story and there's something that we've all had to work through. And I think if we can learn to listen to that instead of what we hear other people tell us or say to us to keep us in that box, then so many of us would take more risks. That is Kelly Kitley. I'm Amy Guth, and this is Unconventional, the podcast about people who are doing things very much their own way. So Kelly Kelly is a licensed clinical social worker with 20 years of experience in the field, and she's a sought-after international women's mental health expert and author of the book, Myself, an Autobiography of Survival. Kelly, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Hi, Aim. Thank you for having me. I'm so delighted that you said yes. So there's so many things I think we could, there's so many places we could start talking about your relationship to unconventional thinking and actions and all that. But I think I would like to start with the concept of risk. That's a topic I love to talk a lot about, but I wonder how that has manifested in your life. Well, that is so serendipitous that you say that because that is my word for this year. <gasps> I love it. <laughs> Although some people who know me might be like, um, I don't that's know sort of make any more risks. That's always your, your that's that's your, your your word every year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But for some reason it just really stuck out this year. And I think for a long time I lived in this box of maybe feeling like I had to do the right thing. And and I'm talking like 20 years ago, you know, I, yes. I've I've recreated myself as this risk taker, but wanting to do kind of the next right thing and what I'm supposed to do and the shoulds and that just didn't really feel good. And so I started taking risks in terms of being motivated when people were telling me I couldn't do something. I was like, well, let me say about that. And that just really encouraged me to take huge risks from asking men out <laughs> when they wouldn't ask me out to, you know, writing a book when colleagues told me it would ruin my career. So, you know, I have found that it's been really rewarding um, and scary as hell, but I am so glad that I have taken the risks that I have. Otherwise I wouldn't have experienced half the things I have in my life. I want to go to this book that the colleagues told you that you would ruin your career with this book. I've read this book. I can't imagine what would be career ruining about it, but what was their, what was their thought on that? Well, when I worked in group practices, there were hierarchies, you know, um, psychiatrists have a little bit of a higher rank than licensed clinical social workers. And I think some of them have this old school mentality that the expert is supposed to sit there and not say much and that the client should not know all that much about the professional. And that if people knew that I had a history of sexual trauma and an eating disorder and substance use disorder, that they would not think I was very professional. And when I did publish that book, I simultaneously left the group practice and had never been busier in my life because people who did read the book said, oh my gosh, I relate so much to parts of your story. I feel like you'll really understand me. I love that. And I feel like that's a theme that we hear when we talk to people that take risks is, you know, when I listened to myself and did the thing I knew I had to do, like it was burning a hole in my chest, I had to do it. Mm -hmm. It worked out unbelievably well. Absolutely. And I think if we can learn to listen to that instead of what we hear other people tell us or say to us to keep us in that box, then so many of us would take more risks. Oh, sure. I mean, I think a lot about the things people say, I think it's sometimes it's like a, it's like a knee jerk reaction. People, if you say, I'm going to go do this thing, they're like, are you sure? Are you, are you, you, you sure you, you're going to do that? Why, why are you going to do that? Let's unpack that a little, because I feel like it's maybe making them feel a little anxious about ways in which they have upheld the status quo and gone along with the things. But where do you, what is that about when people <laughs> push back on, on mm-hmm. risk takers? You are so psychologically savvy because that's called projection. <laughs> And so it's like, when you say that you want to do that, that makes me feel nervous. And so I'm going to question if that's really something you want to do. So for me, I think in that situation that I described about writing a book, I mean, certainly my own family's reaction was, are you sure you want to do that? But 
understandably so it was because there was a lot of nerves around that and what that could possibly say about them. But when colleagues would say that, I think that they may be feeling that way about themselves. Like if my, if my patients knew what I have been through, maybe they would think differently of me. Maybe that's their own narrative that they're projecting onto me. And was it the case at all? Did you have any kind of blowback from writing the book? I had one client in my history of people I had worked with over 10 years who said, would you drink in between your sessions? And were you ever drunk during a session with me? Who said, I don't think that makes me feel very comfortable, which I responded, I didn't drink during the day and I didn't drink at work. And no, I was sober during our sessions, but thought that maybe I was a lesser of a clinician because I was binge drinking at night, which I'm sure I probably was. So there is like this expectation then that our psychological professionals, our mental health professionals are these perfect creatures that have no issues whatsoever and have nothing to work on themselves that are just, I mean, is that the expectation you feel like you run into? I think with a certain population, it is there are, you know, it's not a hard and fast thought of clinicians, but it's actually the total opposite. Most of us get into this field because we've experienced something and come through the other side has been my experience with my colleagues and still go through through things. I think that's why COVID has been so humbling for so many of us because we're struggling too as professionals and clinicians and running households and navigating e-learning and things like that. And so oftentimes I would have clients say to me, well, you have four kids. What are you doing? You know, like, how are you taking care of your mental health? And, and so there's like an even playing field there that everybody appreciates. I want to back up again to, cause you kind of just like slip this in as we were talking, you mentioned that at the time the book came out, you, you started your own private practice, another risk. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Well, that was another thing that, you know, I was very specific about my vision. We were talking about you saying things out loud that we want to attract into our life. And I did. I said, you know, I have these four little kids at home. I had been working nights and weekends seeing clients. And I said, I want to work from 6 a.m. to 3 (laughs) p.m. And I don't want to take insurance. And I want this beautiful office on Michigan Avenue in the Neiman Marcus building. And the rent was very expensive, but I did it. And I worked six to three and I didn't take insurance. And it, it, it was almost humorous that I was doing these things that people said, you will never, you can never, people don't do that. And if I listened to those limiting beliefs, some days I'm like, I'm really doing this. I'm really doing what I said I wanted to do. Um, Now it's over zoom, but those things that I wanted to do that other people said that I couldn't, I'm doing. And we're so heavily socialized to uphold the status quo, to do things a certain way. I I believe there's no one way to do anything. I think there's a bajillion options for everything. We, We tend to just see one or two, but there's always ways to do things. How can you troubleshoot that? If you find yourself really feeling stuck and you're like, I feel like I'm kind of crumbling under the expectations of others or structures or society or whatever, where do you start to just crumble it and see through it and listen to, well, what is it that I really want? Well, then that's such a great question because that's what I help coach people to do because some of us are born into the world, risk takers and, you know, have these big ideas and artistic and things like that. But most of us are kind of taught these ways of thinking. And so in cognitive behavioral therapy, I call it, what are your limiting beliefs? Like, what are the things that are ingrained in your brain that you have heard other people say? And usually it's, I can't, or I'm not smart enough, or I won't make enough money, fill in the blank. And it's okay, write those down, look at those, but what could happen if you took this risk? What are the things that would outweigh that? And then there's more of a buy-in to reframing the way we say it. So if my limiting belief was, oh my gosh, and this was true, how am I going to support myself and our, help contribute to our family if I'm working in a cash business without taking insurance? I had to reframe. That was my fear. My, I had to reframe that by saying, you will figure out a way to do that. And if you can't, you're employable and you will go back and find another job. But if I didn't try, gratefully, it worked. 
you know, but there are still some, some weeks when I'm slow that I'm like, oh gosh, maybe I should it's go happening. to visits and a nine to five job. And, you know, all these things that, that feel more secure, but when I've done that, don't feed my soul as much. For as much as we talk about jobs in terms of security, I feel like in times when I have been employed in one place, I've only had one job at one point in my life. I've always had multiple things because that's more interesting to me. <laughs> right, right. But but I have found I felt more at risk when I had just one job to depend on. You're kind of at the whims of your boss. Whereas if you have kind of the portfolio of things going, you sort of make your own fate. I felt more security doing that than I ever did working for someone else. Well, you are wired very differently. <laughs> oh, this people. we know. Do you know my story about jumping in the pool? Do you know no. this story? Okay, no. this is why. This okay. I, I like your, as a mental health professional, I would like your take on this. When I was about four, my dad took me to a public pool and he took me to the deep end and he was like, look at the drain down there. How far do you think it is from the drain to the top of the water? Do you think it's about a tree or how, how much? And I was like, I don't know. Yeah, probably like tree. And he throws me in. And what I remember coming up and thinking like, oh shit, I'm drowning. And he goes, hey, I'm not gonna let you drown, but you do have to swim to me. And so the next thing I remember is I learned how to swim. I, I could swim and I figured it out because I had to. And I think that's been my whole life mm -hmm. ever since was like, my confidence is highest when I just hop in and figure it out. I could read about it all day. I could yeah. go get a master's in it and it doesn't matter until I do it. Then I'm like, got it. We're good. That's my, like, so yes, I, I am definitely wired weirdly in that way, but that's mm -hmm. why I'm so fascinated by people taking risks and doing this kind of stuff because that's always served me so well. I feel like I see a lot of people in the world that are miserable because they're dying to take a risk and they won't do it. Oh, sure. And you're, I mean, you're talking about experiential learning, you know, and a lot of times I hear people say, I can't do this until this, yeah. you know, and there are all of these benchmarks that they need to meet or make before they make a huge decision. And I mean, I had the chills when you were telling me that story, my dad threw me in the deep end. He wasn't very, um, <laughs> He didn't reassure me that I could swim. He was just like, figure it out, you know, but it, it, it's that same kind of idea of like, I, I don't have a choice, you know? And I think that you and I, probably why we click so well is because we do have a similar philosophy in that. And I think that being able to spread that joy and that being contagious of when you see other people take risks, you're more likely to do it. You know, oh, yeah, I yeah. think if somebody else can lead the way, then you're like, well, if she can do it, I can do it. And then it's a ripple effect. And I think there's a role for proof of, of attacking your limiting beliefs. There's like a little baby step that you can take to go, well, wait a minute, I'm not an idiot. I just did a great job on that project. Maybe mm -hmm. I can do more. And I feel like it kind of expands your thinking about something when you're in new territory or trying to push through a limit or something like that. Well, sure. You have to have positive affirmation or reassurance yeah. that what you're doing is okay. Otherwise it's really scary. So you do have to take those baby steps. Right. Yeah. And then you're, you're getting positive feedback. Like this isn't as hard as I thought, or, you know, this feels really good. Let me see if I do push a little further, what happens. Pushing even further into risk. The book has turned into a film. Talk to me about that. Blood, sweat, and tears, lady. I yeah. mean, Yes. My husband, Ryan Kitley is an actor. We always had this idea of working together in some capacity. That is not my wheelhouse whatsoever, but we linked up with a, a local Oak Park um, husband and wife production company, um, Tarleton Dawn Productions. And I raised a ton of money to make this film uh, from people in our community. And um, my husband played himself in the movie because it's based on our story and my journey to sobriety. And um, we're using it as an educational tool to educate people about mental health, family dynamics and substance abuse. I got to say, I went to the screening of that and my most favorite part was watching your face during all that. Cause I was like, that's gotta be super weird. <laughs> Your husband is playing himself eight years ago mm -hmm. and, and there's this other woman playing you. That's got to be super strange and also real vulnerable for you. I was like looking at your face the whole time going, I wonder what in the hell is going through her head right now. <laughs> it's probably a lot. You know, I, 
I felt so far removed from it in a lot of ways yeah. because writing the book was even that much more vulnerable and raw because I had to revisit these places intensely to be able to describe what it was like in this piece. Like I was the COVID officer on set and making sure people were fed. And so, yes, I mean, every time we made adjustments and saw pieces of the film come together, I was so tearful (laughs) and it was super vulnerable sitting in a room with all these people who saw the movie for the first time. But I hate to be cliche and say it was life-changing, but it was life-changing in the sense of that feeling of normalcy that I hid from for so long and feeling Mm -hmm. like I was different and, and recognizing all the people who come forward and say me too. And that connection that you make to not feel so alone. That's what helped me heal a ton. Uh, So I feel like the theme for you is, well, there's many themes for you, but one of the themes for you is really about the power of being very openly vulnerable of how much that has brought people into your orbit. You were doing the thing, you were working in the mental health field, successfully doing all that, but then you come out with all this, all this in your book and suddenly it drew people to you like, whoa. And the, the film sounds like, so it seems like every time you kind of like peel off a layer, you get a lot of validation and a lot of a lot of eyes on you for that. Yes. And that's what keeps me sober. And that's yeah. what keeps me in this healing process because I'm reminded of it because when I'm not in that world, whether it's talking to other sober moms or friends or just any of that, then I forget. And I'm like, here I am alone again. I'm in this world where everybody drinks and why am I the only one who doesn't, you know? So it is, it's, it's validating that there is a whole community of people out there who feel connected to my story because at the end of the day, we all have a story and there's something that we've all had to work through, if not multiple things. Have you always felt like your risk taking and, and unconventional thinking, have you always felt like that was a superpower or did you ever feel challenged by it? I have felt it's a superpower, especially when people say to me, like, how do you do that? Or why did you do that? Or question it, that it feels like, I mean, I don't even think twice about it now. I just do it. And, you know, even if people were like, oh, you probably shouldn't have reached out to that person or that was bold or whatever. I'm like, what's the person going to say? No, you know, or like not answer my email or whatever it might be that I don't even think twice about it. And I'm like, life would be way too boring if I put these limits on what I'm supposed to do. And I mean, I have to caution myself. I'm a little impulsive too. So I have to keep an eye on it, but it's like, I like living that way. Was that ever not a superpower? Was that ever something you felt self-conscious about maybe when you were younger? I never remember feeling self-conscious about it, but it was something that people questioned. You know, I think that's the thing I keep coming back to is like, I guess that that would equate to self-consciousness. Like, is there something wrong with me that all these people ask me that? So yeah, I never thought about, thank you for the therapy session. (laughs) (laughs) I never felt like that before until I can really sit. It was like, yes, there's something wrong with me that I want to do that or be that or... I didn't get a ton of validation growing up. I think the world's built to not validate that. If we Mm -hmm. were all big risk takers, systems that keep us all, you know, humming along wouldn't work so well because we'd be constantly challenging them. Sure. We'd all be running for office and doing things and you know, it would be like a hot mess because we'd all be out like, says who? Why why should I do that? No, I'm out. You know, like we'd all be doing these right. things. That's a good point. So so what do you wish that more people, maybe especially like your uh your clients or, or people who are seeking mental health help, what do you wish more people understood about the power of unconventional thinking? How um limitless it can be in terms of being able, I mean, our brain is so powerful. And sometimes when we can like quiet the noise and really be present with like, what do we feel in our gut, in our heart, which, you know, I do talk therapy. So (laughs) to hear me say that is like, you know, it is such a mind body connection. And I oftentimes think people are so disconnected from those two things, which is why I, tr- I am a huge advocate for mindfulness and meditation, because when we can feel what that energy is and that calling, and we can quiet our mind, I think we'd all take more risks. 
So sometimes it's like, tell the bitch to shut up and just be quiet. And like, you know, the answer then I'm going to start referring to my, my mind as that bitch, (laughs) tell the bitch to shut up. (laughs) I enjoy that very much. Is there advice that you hear often? um, Not that you give, but advice you hear other people give that feels counterintuitive to you. I mean, one I hear a lot is when people say, think outside the box, because I think nothing will make you think <laughs> less outside the box than being told to think outside the box. Sure. My favorite is when people say, well, don't care so much whatever other people think. That's like telling somebody who's feeling anxious to calm down. You're going to feel more anxious if somebody's telling you that. So it's to break it down. Like, well, what is it about what other people think? that make you feel like you can't take that risk. So it's a thought, but there's always something behind that thought. We do care what other people think. You know, what does taking this risk say about you? So for example, when I took this risk to leave this practice and start my own business, it was, what are my in-laws gonna think of me taking this huge risk with four kids and a, a husband who's an actor? Like how irresponsible. And so I had to look through that limiting belief and break it down to say, I do care what they think, but it also encourages me to want to succeed so that I can feel good about that. You know, if I don't know if I would have pushed as hard, well, maybe I would have, but like, I didn't want it to not work out because this was this vision that I had. So I think sometimes we need to know where our limits are, but at the same time, it was so empowering to me to tell myself that I needed to figure this out somehow, because this is what I really wanted. I love that. I had a a martial arts teacher when I was in the Krav Maga world who used to help people break fear down into little pieces. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not that you're afraid of getting on a plane. Let's talk about what bothers you. You're afraid of landing and takeoff. You're afraid of putting your life in someone's hands who you don't know. Like, let's make this increasingly smaller, smaller, smaller. And so to me, that's go talk with the in-laws there. You know, there's this idea of like everybody, you know, what does everybody think? And you're like, oh God, everybody is a lot. But then it's like, okay, I'm going to deal with the in-laws and right. they're on board. They support me. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go deal with this person now. I'm going to go deal with other colleagues. And then it kind of shrinks this fear, which I think is very cool. Yeah. And those people might not be supportive. I mean, I remember having that yeah. conversation and it was like, you're renting an office space where, and how much are you paying for that? And, and it's like, you know, and they come from the mentality of like, you should belong to a union and have a pension and, you know, but having that conversation and knowing not everybody's going to support you, you know, the way it would, we'd all take more risks if we felt people were like holding us and supporting us and hugging us along the journey. But sometimes it's like, you may be the only one who believes this and that's enough. I don't know if you feel this, but I feel like people who are pretty risk tolerant, I don't think it occurs to people to tell us good job. Cause I think they think like, Oh, you're so confident. You just went and did that. I don't need to tell you anything. You're fine. Totally. <laughs> Totally. But we do. I mean, I yeah, do. for sure we do. But then, and then if you say like, if you ask someone what they thought, they're like, oh, well, of course I think that's awesome. I just, I figured you didn't need to hear it. Right. <laughs> I'm a person. <laughs> for you, what is the most unconventional, like pie in the sky, big, big thing that's in your sights? A feature film of right. this short film or a series a lot of the feedback that we've received is people want more. They want to understand how this woman gets help. She asks for help at the end of the movie, but like, how does she get there? What actually, what treatment works for her? How does she live her life in sobriety? And I think that that's out there. Again, it takes a lot of money and a lot of different connections, but you know, it only takes one. However, that's going to happen. I do believe it will happen and I'll keep taking those risks to get there. And look, someone greenlit Sharknado. So, I mean, stranger things have happened. (laughs) Like, just hold on to that. Somebody said yes to Sharknado. Someone will say yes to you for sure. (laughs) All right. So we got the film. We got the book. Where can people go to find out more about them, consume them, follow you and all your stuff? Sure. So my website is just my name, 
K-E-L-L-E-Y, Kitley, K-I-T-L-E-Y.com. And I am very active on social media on um, Instagram is a great place to find me. Again, my name, Kelly Kitley or Facebook, Kelly Rumpsa Kitley, my maiden name. But yeah, it's a great way to connect. I post lots of articles that I contribute to or TV appearances on mental health and wellness. And um, just so grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Oh, let's go back to your TV appearances then for a sec. Because <laughs> one day I like roll into Facebook and I was like, she's, her friend looks like Drew Barrymore. Oh, that she, she's with Drew Barrymore. That's she's okay. This is what she's doing now. How did that come about? <laughs> okay. Well, talk about risk taking, right? Who brings their autobiography to Drew Barrymore and says, Hey, we want to do a feature together. And will you play me? They had no interest in that. They just wanted me as a paid uh, segment. <laughs> for a hair model where I, anyway, but, you know, through a lot of the work that I've done in mental health, I've connected with a lot of different producers. And this one producer I worked with on Dr. Oz was doing a segment with Drew Barrymore and they were looking for a woman and a mom in the, the mental health field. And I fit the description. So I didn't get to promote my book or talk about my movie, but I did get my hair done and I did get dressed by a professional and, you know, took a black car and all that. It was really fun and met Drew Barrymore. It was great, but it was like, ugh, I felt like a little bit of a sellout there because I didn't really get to promote something that was worthwhile, but my hair. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing about, about media kits is that yeah. people just glance at those things. Mm-hmm. And there's, they're going to see like a screen grab of you and Drew Barrymore and be like, oh, look at her, all the press she's gotten. Look at all of the things. <laughs> it's true. People glance, glance, and they'll just like a name uh-huh. or a, like one time I retweeted a New York Times story and I said, this uh-huh. is a really powerful op-ed. And someone was like, I was reading your recent op-ed in New York Times. I was like, I didn't write it. I just retweeted it, but people don't look. So it doesn't uh-huh. take much to get people just going, hey. oh which is not at all to say like fabricate that, but just that people will have seen that picture of you and Drew Barrymore and give a sense of validity to it. They will give you credit for it even, like they won't even bother to look at the whole story, which is just to say, even if you didn't talk about the book and the movie while you were there, it still mattered. You know, it still counted. It's still a feather in your cap. I'll keep that in my back pocket because, you know, I mean, that goes back to another kind of um, risk-taking PR people are, I hear like 10 grand. That was the quote that I got per month, you know? And I was like, well, I can't afford that. So I'll just go on LinkedIn and like ask producers from the Today Show to connect and then pitch to them. You know, I don't know how that works on the other side, but I keep doing it. And sometimes they say yes. And sometimes they say no, but like for every hundred I pitch, I might get one. (laughs) And sometimes Drew Barrymore's people do your hair. Yeah. It's all good. That was the one. That was the one. (laughs) I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much. I super appreciate you. Everybody go watch the film, go buy the book, follow her, do all the things. Kelly, you're the best. Thanks so much for talking today. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for listening to Unconventional with Amy Guth. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode and find me at Amy Guth on social media.